So the Quran touches on something which is popular, popular culture, camels, horses, touches on phenomena and history, the ilaf of the Quraysh, and it touches on spirituality. So Allah calls the Prophet bayina, right? He calls the Prophet this thing that you know you're waiting on, this clear proof. And they were like, yeah, we knew, but it's just not the guy we wanted, but yeah. It talks about, about social phenomenon. Right? The, the infant will say, why have you killed me? It doesn't say, this is haram. It just mentions that it's bad to touch the psyche of the people. So the last few chapters of the Quran, really, if you think about it, are a lesson in how to make religion at a popular cultural level relevant, at a phenomena level relevant, relevant at crime, right? Relevant and social issues relevant. So it's really an inspiration. That's why Imam al Jassas he says very beautifully in his explanation of Quran that those verses that are left to Arab customs, it is upon the Muslims who come after the Arabs who live in different cultures to recalibrate the language of those customs in a way that's relevant to the people they live with. Why haven't we been able to do this? Because education, unfortunately, in the Muslim community in America for the last 30 or 40 years has been about authority, not about inspiration. Right? It's a bit about challenging people instead of inspiring people right? and encouraging them to be responsible. Yes, but inspiring them to that responsibility. And the last reason that Bayan is important now is independence. Like, we have to support them to stay independent. Like if the government called me and offered me $800,000, I'm not going to hang up the phone, man. That's a lot of kale from Whole Foods. Half. But I'm saying like, we were upset these entities, you know, some of us took the money, but then we need to be responsible for making sure the entities don't have to take that money or we can't complain. And I'll give you an example. David Horwitz in California. All of us know David. He used to be a hippie and a follower of Timothy Leary. Now he's just freaking crazy. Um, he has been labeled as the leader of, by the Southern Poverty Saw, uh, uh, Center, a uh, leader of a hate group. Right? Organization has articles like Muslim robbed a store. Because they're like, the only people robbing stores are Muslims. Right. It's funny, but now we're starting to see Frankenstein walking down that hill. You know, it's interesting. Since January, if you look at my, my, and I'm sure Marwa, if you look at her Twitter feed, it went from like issues of like faith and youth empowerment, right, in November, October, Sarcasian issues, Syrian issues. Mine was, of course, beauty tips. <laughs> we, we know that since January, now, I went back and looked at my Twitter feed. It's Muslim shot and killed. Muslim Somali taxi driver beaten to death. Jewish cemeteries being violated. Sacred lands of our Native American brothers and sisters being threatened. Like, it's really switched. Like, it's gone in a very, very frightening turn, right? And every three or four days now, I'm like, Muslim shot, Muslim beaten, mosque burned, mosque surrounded, sister threatened. And, and the... Uh, the proponent of this were people like David Horwitz. But David Horwitz now is under investigation, thank God, finally, for a tax problem because he runs a nonprofit. And that nonprofit donated $134,000 to our wonderful friend in the Netherlands who may actually win election. His political party, now those of us in the nonprofit sector we know you're just not supposed to give money to political parties, especially overseas. He didn't report that in his taxes. So now he's under investigation. Here's the point. If he could raise $134,000, man, to send to a political party of hate overseas, and we can't raise $800,000 to do what I just talked about, then we deserve what we get.